have to leave it with God, don't we? And uh, for her just to ring back and say, do you remember me? I didn't remember it at all. One of probably a lot of people that came to the youth uh, during that period of time where we sowed some seed. But God has brought it to pass. Amen. So we, we thank him for that. Um, as I say, I've only had a couple of hours to pull this together. So please forgive me if it's a little bit disjointed. Um, so we're going we're gonna to look at some verses from Mark's Gospel. I think it, I think it's Mark 11. I haven't, I haven't read the scripture down. Uh, I think it's Mark 11 and verse 12. If it, if it says about the fig tree and the clearing of the temple, then we're in the right place. Um, just to say, you know, our ministry goes out to a lot of places, and uh, I know we've got over 660 subscribers now on YouTube. And 70? It's gone up. It is a fig tree, yeah, it's okay. And that's going up, so if you're listening by the internet, welcome. Please have a look at some of the stuff by Pete But it was life-changing. He changed uh, part of my life when I was just a little boy at 11. And to be under such great ministry and, and for it to challenge me. And I probably wouldn't be standing here doing what I'm doing if it hadn't been for the teaching and the work of the youth camps that put Pete ran. So have a listen to that. And coming up, we've got Maggie Gill, who works with Jackie Pullinger. And she's coming in, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Um, Jackie's on fire at the moment. Wherever you go, Jackie Pullinger is telling people to preach the gospel because the end of the world's coming and uh, they're seeing hundreds and thousands of people in China come to God. Uh, part of the underground church just exploding again and again. And they're seeing real deliverance and miracles. And um, sometimes, you know, I I've known Maggie tell me that she's sat in a room with somebody on drugs and they've prayed over that person and read scriptures and prophesied and spoken to us for 12 hours until God's finally broke through. And those people are transformed forever. And those people are community transformers as well. So we're going to be exciting when Maggie comes and shares. She used to be a school teacher at Ellows Hall. Uh, she became a school teacher inspector and then she went on the mission field and she speaks both Chinese languages now. Just an incredible woman of God. So we're looking forward to that. So uh, be here or listen on the internet. That's great. So we're on chapter 11 of Mark's Gospel and verse 12. And um, let me read these verses to you. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing a distance, a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. I'm going to come back to that. That's an interesting part of the story tonight. He said to the tree, may no man eat of you fruit any more. And the disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began to drive out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He would not allow any of them to carry merchandise to the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking, away for a way, looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him. And the whole crowd were amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, they went out into the, Jesus came to his disciples and they went out into the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt it there in their heart, but believes they will have what they, say, what they say will happen and it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe when you receive it and it will be yours. When you're standing praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. We've been saying, haven't we, and I said it on Sunday night and it was so great to have so many unsaved people in here again, is that, you know, Jesus is perfect theology. When we look at Jesus, we see God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, as we have started to, this year, push into discipleship, I'm spending a lot more of my time here as your pastor with individuals, pouring my life into them to try and give them some growth in God. Because that's what true discipleship is all about. And that's why we have some guys on, on a Monday at Costa. You're quite welcome. Man, women or child, it doesn't really matter. We just got together and begin to share our hearts and pray for each other and just uh, support each other. But even just sitting with, I think I told you this the other day, even sitting with James, uh, pray for us. We've got a, a meeting with Warsaw Education Authority 
uh, the police, the head teaching, senior teaching staff of Blue Coat School in Warsaw. So, because James is wanting to run a program to reach gang members and those already in gangs. And there's a huge opportunity. He needs some back, he needs some help, he needs some, but he needs to put his PowerPoints together and put him in the right direction and lead a couple of workshops with him. So I volunteered to do that in the first instance until he can get a team around him. But pray for us that God might open these doors. They've even put funding in place, so we're not even worried about money, which is normally the big issue. No issue with money, but we want God to do this. And if, if it works, it'll be a pilot scheme that will be run across the whole of the black country in all the Church of England schools. So can you pray for that? But one of the things I, I found with James, who's come an incredible story, he heard his testimony a few Sundays ago, was that you know he was such a messed up character, and now he's come to Christ, he's full on. So what he wants to do, he wants to drink from every single fountain he can find. So he's got the God Channel on, he's got UCB going on, he's reading about 15 different books. He's going to any meeting he can find because he's drinking in the Word of God. But one of the things I had to do is sit him down and go, look, you know, you're confusing yourself. You're taking in too many streams. Let's just go back to Mark's Gospel. Let's read about Jesus. Let's read a chapter a day together and pray that God will... Open our eyes, because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. That's what I mean about his perfect theology. He is perfect theology. So we want to encourage all of us to get back to the basics. We say get sometimes so entrenched in doctrine and stuff. I just want to be like Jesus. And uh, I can forgive people who have different opinions to me and dull different preferences to me, just as long as we're all striving to be like Jesus. Loving like Jesus, walking like Jesus, being kind like Jesus. So... Um, as we look into these verses tonight, I just want to take them on face value. Sometimes people flower stuff up. I'm just going to try and give it you as I, I saw it this afternoon. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find it, but it didn't have any fruit. So the narrative of the gospel here paints for us a picture of Jesus engaged in ministry. And because he's engaged in ministry, he's moving from place to place. He didn't like kind of get a single base, just say in Bethany or in Galilee. In fact, I don't know whether you have felt this as you've read the Gospels. It seems to me that Jesus seems to hop all over the place. In fact, actually, you'd be forgiven to believe that he didn't really have a coherent plan whatsoever because he was up here and down there and he's shooting across here and he had to go via somewhere else to meet a woman here and it just seems like it was a little bit haphazard. But we know if you sin Jesus, you've sinned the Father. He wasn't haphazard. There was a divine plan. And every morning Jesus got up early before his disciples and he prayed and he received the plan from heaven. So in any given day, it might look Jesus like he didn't know what he was doing. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And that behests us as believers in Christ to pray and have this prayer life with Jesus that is such that we don't just give him our shopping list, but we open our ears for direction and purpose every single day. So... Tomorrow when you get up, say, God, what is it? I've got some needs for you to meet today, if you would. And you've got some promises that you said you would. But what am I doing today? What are we doing together? I think when you start to pray those prayers, you start to see opportunities that you never saw before. And that's how Jesus was. But it seems he's a little bit random. He's all over the place. And he says Jesus was hungry. I wonder why Mark threw that in. That little throwaway statement, Jesus was hungry. Well, I believe that Mark wanted the readers to understand that Jesus faced all the natural challenges that we do. The Bible says he was just like us, yet without sin. So he got tired. He got hungry. I'm sure he got disappointed. And we know from the passage that we're just about to read, he got angry as well. So all the emotions that we feel as believers, Jesus went before us and he lived through all of that sort of stuff. And... Um, Preaching the gospel and living out the gospel is hard work. And that's why I'm glad Shirley's had some time in tonight, because she deserves some time in tonight. She needs to rest, because you can't keep at it 24 hours a day. And I learned that lesson very quickly in the new year, as you well know. And to take some time off really kind of put me back in focus again. But we all need to know the lessons that you can't just burn your Sabbaths off. You have to take your time out and let God refresh you and renew you. And Jesus faces all of these challenges. You see, we're not superhuman. I often tell this story, but uh, Sue Nichols and, and Joe will tell you. The first trip we took to Romania, 
uh, on mission. It was the first mission I'd ever been on. And if you get a chance to go on mission, Janet and John are taking another one in September again. And there's some folks going on. And we're hoping to get back in connection with Romania. And Steve's looking to do a mission to Israel. So there's plenty of opportunity for people to go and do stuff abroad if they want to. But one of the things that I, I said to Claire, well, Claire said to me, she said, Steve, you're not going to leave if they give you bad food because me and my food go hand in hand. So she packed some stuff into my suitcase. Now, I had never in my life drunk energy drinks. Anybody drink them energy drinks? They're from the devil, honestly. That Red Bull stuff is from the devil. I didn't know that. So she packs me two one-litre bottles of this energy drink in just in case I get a little bit like needing some sustenance and biscuits and stuff. And uh, when we get there, nobody told them that you have to put the pasta in the best place. They put me in the worst place. So everybody else had a nice little house. I was on the 10th floor of the communist apartment block with a broken lift. So by the time I got to the top of the stairs in my suitcase in 100 degrees heat, I was, the sweat was pouring out my head. And the family, bless them, decided to go out and leave me on my own. Now, I was told you couldn't drink the water, so I was not going to drink the water. So I was looking around in this little apartment for something to drink. And then I suddenly re re realised, ah, Claire's packed me these two litres of energy drink. I drunk them, both of them. And I never slept a wink all night. But as stupid as I, th I was, I thought, this is amazing. You know, when you come into mission, you get under right anointing. I mean, the Holy Spirit speaking to me, I can't go to sleep. And then when I got up in the morning, I was so shattered. And the rest, the, 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 when I got downstairs, Sue said, you idiot, you shouldn't have drunk the two litres. There's no wonder you stopped all, all, all night. So, But we're not like that. We're not superhuman. And, and I think that's what this, this is pointing out. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was tired. And there are rhythms in our lives but we need to be in touch with, with God as we walk through every single area of our days. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found it had nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Now, that's a bit of a strange story, really, in a way, because he already says it's not the season for figs. So why did he go and see? Well, actually, the leaves and the figs on the tree come at the same time. That's the way it works in the Middle East, apparently. The leaves and the figs come at the same time. So if you see something with some leaves, you start to believe there's some fruit behind the leaves. You know, the leaves cover the tree, but, you know, because the leaves are out, then you start to think to yourself, there must be some fruit there. So this is a very interesting passage here. He looks from a distance, and he seems to be laden with fruit. Don't ever look at stuff from a distance, spiritually. It's too often we can judge people from a distance. You have to walk in their shoes to understand what some people have been through. And I've, I've learned that the hard way the last few months and weeks. Because I hadn't been ill for 10 years. Even the doctor didn't recognise who I was. She didn't have any notes for me or anything when I went to see her. But suddenly I started to think, well, I've always, kind of, I've always prayed for people and love people who have been poorly. Now I'm poorly. It's a whole different story, isn't it? So don't ever, don't ever judge anything from a distance, what it appears to be. It appeared to be laden with fruit. But as I just said, the norm was the leaf and the fruit grow together at the same time. See, what I think what's happening in this passage is Jesus does nothing or says nothing that he doesn't hear his father say or do. So he's already been praying that morning. And he knows he's going to have some kind of encounter. And I believe God the Father has been speaking to, to the, about the spiritual nature of Israel. Because he's going around in ministry and for as many miracles as he's seen, he's seen a whole lot of conflict as well. Don't ever be tempted to believe that Jesus had it easy, that all these miracles were flowing. There was a lot of opposition as well. And again, read the book of Acts only to find out where there is great blessing, there's also great opposition. And so I believe the Holy Spirit had been speaking to him in the morning, the Father had been talking to him, talking to him about the spiritual state of the nation. And I believe that it's, it's a, a prophetic statement. Cursing the fig tree was Jesus' way of saying to the whole nation, you look like you should be producing some fruit, but actually when you look behind the leaves, you're naked. It's a bit like the emperor's new clothes, isn't it? I was appalled the other week, I don't know if some of you saw that, uh, that uh, lady from one of the universities. She decided to strip naked for Brexit. Did you see that? And she shouted, it's the Emperor's New Clothes. And she'd written things across a pitch that you shouldn't be reading. So, But she was on GMTV and they fuzzed it all out. But I think that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. He, he was looking at the fig tree with leaves on it saying, you look the part, but actually there's nothing of substance behind you. I think he's saying exactly to the nation of Israel and to his people, you look spiritual, but actually you've 
you're bankrupt spiritually. There's nothing there. There's no fruit behind what looks like it ought to be have some fruit behind it. So they had a form of religion. You, know, you, you, you see Jesus mingling with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. And they all have their opinion. And yet they're not producing fruit in keeping with righteousness. Jesus challenged them so many times. He seemed to have it all right and yet he's so very, very wrong. Their hearts were far from God. He, he, he says that. You see, you're like one of those vessels. You, know, you look clean on the outside, but inside you're absolutely filthy. It's a big, same kind of analogy. You look like you've got fruit because you've got leaves, but actually when you look beyond the leaves, there's no fruit. So it's, it's, a, big, it's a big challenge for us all that we, we don't just manifest the leaves and that we don't judge other people and we look at their lives and go, well, you know, I don't like the way they are. I just, you know, too, too much, too much this, too much. Listen, we, we need to look for the fruit. Jesus said, by our fruit, we will be known. Because God hates hypocrisy. And this, this tree appeared to be something that it wasn't. This tree appeared to be something that it wasn't. And throughout the Bible, you, you hear words of blessing and cursing, but they always are to do with the way people choose to live their lives and when we looked at the minor prophet stuff in particular I read these verses but they're both reading again tonight from Deuteronomy 28 however if you do not obey the Lord your God and do carefully and follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today all these curses will come upon you and overtake you you know what Jesus says to this victory you're cursed but I believe it was a prophetic picture of Israel and and because there was no substance behind what was going on Jesus was very frustrated with it all. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus enters the temple courts and begins driving out those who were buying and selling. You see, what you have to do with the Bible is you have to, you have to keep on reading and connecting the dots. You can't read it in isolation. The Bible talks about do, 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 uh, correctly dividing the word of truth. And you have to sometimes put things in context. Now, the cursing of the fig tree and what we are just about to see are not two separate related issues. Same day, same Jesus who spoke to the Father that morning. So when he's speaking to the Father and he says, I never do anything that I don't see him doing or, or, or hear anything that I don't see him say. And so following the heart of the Father, he's clearly had some instruction for the day. The whole thing about the fig tree and, and what was happening in the hearts of his people, especially the religious leaders in particular. And so now he finds himself in the temple with those buying and selling. Now, I don't want you, don't you to get me wrong. What was happening in the, in the temple was legitimate. People would travel from all over the country to bring their sacrifice to God and make peace by the old covenant. And so you couldn't expect a bloke who lived 40, 50 miles away to put two goats and a donkey on his back and, and, and travel all the way there. You know, it's, there had to be a place where he could buy a sacrifice so he could make his sacrifice. So the buying and selling in the, in the temple courts was quite legitimate. And if you were poor, you could have a couple of turtle doves instead. Well, can you imagine if you're going to walk 40 miles with, a, with a, a couple of young lambs to sacrifice, they'd be dead before you got to the temple. So it's all legitimate. It's all legitimate. But you have to look behind the legitimacy to understand that, there was, again, there was no spiritual fruit. It all looked like what it should do, but underneath, there was no substance there. He overturned the tables of the money of the changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow them to carry merchandise through the temple. He was really angry with the fact that this godly act of worship that was supposed to bless the heart of God and bring peace to his people was now being used for the benefit of the people. This is, this is a very, very powerful set of scriptures here. And a real challenge to us that we don't make worship to God something that is about us. Something about our needs, something about our wants and desires. When we come to the house of God, we make a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes we feel like coming and praising God and sometimes we don't. The issue is not how you feel, the issue is called obedience. And so you, you come into the house of God, these people were coming legitimately to bless God and to bring their sacrifice. You're underlying that there were those that were perpetrating stuff to their benefit and not to God's benefit, and God hates that. God hates stuff being done that's not supposed to be done. And he was angry. Jesus got really, really angry. In fact, it wasn't just to the benefit of some people, it was to the detriment of others. 
especially the poor, those that were selling turtle doves, those are the poor people. They were getting ripped off. Extortionate rates for two little birds to sacrifice to God. And we just have to be really, really careful in the house of God is how we treat other people and, and our motives and what we say. Because our focus has to be to glorify God. See, we can all come to church and look like we've got it sorted because we're full of green leaves. But the truth is, is what our hearts produce and what we're giving back to God and our motives. Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it, uh, was it Samuel when, when, when he was going to, to find a prophet? When he, when he was the prophet, he was going to find a king, David. And uh, he said, uh, God says to him, look, see, Samuel, you, you look on the outward. You, you look at people, the, the way they talk, the way they stand, the way they, the way they make a noise, the way they don't make a noise, the people that look like you, the people that don't look like you. You look on the outward things. But let's be serious tonight, friends. God looks right in on our heart. And I did a whole lot of soul searching while I spent some time on the settee in January. It, it was quite easy to stop my body moving because I was tired and worn out. But to calm my mind down took a whole lot longer. And to start searching my heart was a whole lot of pain. But, you know, it, God was not looking on the outside. He was looking right in on the heart. And uh, it's, a cha it's a challenge. It's a challenge when we come around the community table. Let a man examine himself. Not examine everybody else that's in the building. Just take an inward glance. Because none of us, as I said the other week, none of us are, are, are what we are under the anointing. God blesses us and he's gracious towards us. Jesus became very angry with the merchandisers. They were ripping off their brothers. In fact, you know, they were breaking the two greatest commandments that Jesus had taught about, which was to love God and to love each other. And you know what? They covered it up with a whole lot of spiritual activity. They were still buying and selling it. I bet they were talking to each other, people coming in and going, you want to buy a couple of birds to sacrifice to God? How are you? Where have you come from, my brother? And giving them a hug and a kiss and like pretending it's all all right. On the other, on the, on the other hand, taking far too much money for what they were selling. Making it look legitimate in all the activity of the temple courts. You know, if we could play a video of what that looked like, I bet there was a whole lot of hustle and bustle. Lots of smelly animals, lots of tables, lots of noise, lots of... People thumping the tables, money going up here, there and everywhere. You can imagine the scene, can't you? But in the midst of all that, God's not, Jesus is not looking at that. He's looking right into the hearts of the people and exactly what's happening. So I, I personally don't care how much noise people make as long as, as long as underneath there's the fruit. In fact, the scripture says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. So the inference is to the Lord. We can make a whole lot of noise, but we have to ask ourselves, is it to the Lord? Where is it it's pointed to tonight? And he taught them and he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a robber's den. That's a huge challenge when Christ, the son of the living God, walks into his father's house. And he points the finger at what's happening. He said, this is what it should be. But this is what you have made it. And I'm really conscious of that as I lead this church. I, I, I don't want to make it something that God has not said that it ought to be. Or do stuff that God has not asked us to do. Just, we need to understand it's, this is God's house. And it's all about being a house of prayer. I find that interesting as well because Jesus could have said a lot of things at that point, couldn't he? This is my father's house and it's full of fellowship. We come here to love each other and to have a nice time. He didn't say that, did he? This is my father's house and it's a house of preaching. For as much as we totally believe in preaching because without preaching nobody gets saved, that's what the scripture says. He didn't call it a house of preaching either, did he? He called it a house of prayer for all nations. So what I've seen here is Jesus is saying this. My house should be a place where we pray for everyone. Regardless of creed, colour, persuasion, religion. The house of God should be a house of prayer for every nation. For everybody. An inclusive house. 
A place where we pray for all of humanity that God might intervene in their lives. And that's a challenge and a half. Because it's all right to pray for people that we agree with, but to pray for people we disagree with is another matter completely. I don't know about you, I'm I'm, I'm sick of watching the news right now. I've watched the last two nights of Sky, well, even tonight as well, with voting in the House of Commons. And I just think to myself, nobody in their right mind could be this stupid with what's going on. But we as the Church of Jesus Christ, we're not, I'm not sitting there moaning. I'm praying, God, help our nation and the nations of Europe. And God, let something good come out of this. You know, I've, I've spent too many nights moaning at Question Time and shouting at the television. It does no good. They can't hear you anyway. Have you noticed that? They're all sitting around debating. You're shouting at them and they can't hear a word you say. But what we can do is we can pray. And we need to pray. In fact, can we pray right now for our nation? Because we need some serious answers in a time of crisis. In fact, we've even called it a crisis ourselves. It's all all over the news. Brexit crisis. When you start naming stuff, you have to claim it. That's the the whole problem with it, isn't it? Now we've decided it's it's a crisis. And you start to feel we've got a vacuum full of fear and all sorts of things are starting to happen. And um, Knife crime's on the rise. I wasn't wasn't even going to share this, but today in LO's... My little Joel, he's only 11, walks down the corridor and the police have set up a metal detector and they pull him to one side and they stop and search him and, and they do a random search of the whole school. Now, I'm, I'm in agreement with that because I think they should bring out the knives. But what a state when we've got metal detectors in Gornal and police looking at our kids just in case they're carrying weapons. What a state we've got into. And it's, instead of sitting here moaning, we need to start praying that God's going to do something in our nation. So let me just pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus... Firstly, we pray for our government. We pray for our Prime Minister. Lord, we pray for our Cabinet. We pray for the government and we pray for the opposition. We pray for everyone that is elected member of the First Chamber and the Second Chamber. God, grant them wisdom. God, grant them some sense sense in these moments and this time. And Lord, I just pray that the peace might rule in our nation, that the Gospel might be preached. Lord, we pray for our schools and we pray for our teachers and we pray for those that are just suffering so much right now through the violence of gangs and knives on our streets. God, would you raise up godly leaders. Lord, would you strengthen our police force. But Lord Jesus, I pray that the gospel might have a powerful effect and that your people who are called by your name might humble themselves and pray and seek you and look till you come from heaven and heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. But you, he's saying to the people, not me, I'm God Almighty, I instituted this and I told you what I wanted but you have made this a robber's den. And he's addressing these remarks to the temple leadership. You know he is. God always holds leaders accountable. That's why the Bible entreats us to pray for those who are in authority. So I know it's so easy to moan and groan and cast stones at the politicians and people in public life. We'd be better praying for them than we are moaning about them. You know, and if you speak to any of them, they are, they're, they're, they're devoid of anything apart from natural ideas. We need God's supernatural touch on our nation. And uh, when you see God begin to, when you read the, just read the Bible. There were idiots in the Bible. There, there's been bad times in our world, but far worse than there are now. But when God starts to speak to people and raises up godly leadership, when he says, when, when, when the righteous rule, a nation is exalted, that's what the scripture says. So when God begins to move through people's hearts and lives and godly leaders are raised up, something powerful happens. But God holds all leaders, including those in the church, responsible for what he has placed in their hands. And I've told you on many occasions, I take that incredibly serious, that one day I will stand before Jesus and he will say, what did you do and how did you lead the church? And I will give account, for not only for my life, but for the life of the sheep that I've led. And that, for me, is a scary, scary thing. And I want to, I want to have done the right thing. I want to have done the right thing. And so he, he challenges the, the, the religious leaders, obviously, by, by calling it a house of merchandise or a robber's den. He's actually insulting the leaders. You start insulting some, something that the leaders have been involved in, which they quite obviously were. Don't tell me these people were taking the money because they were taking the money. This, this is organised pilfering. This is by the religious establishment. That's why God got so angry with it. It wasn't just the people. It wasn't just the poor people trying to make a quick book. They were turning a blind eye or even getting paid off for this. 
you know, sometimes we read the scriptures naively, but something was happening here that, that was definitely orchestrated by leadership. Because anything that, you know, I was, I was talking to the other day, I, it was James again, he said, you do not realise, he said, the kids that are in gangs, he said, could be absolutely fantastic business people because their business acumen is far above most business people. Have you ever, ever run a drug cartel and have you ever sold drugs? He said, it's a business all in itself. You know, everything that is done requires leadership. And what was happening here, turning this into a house of mercy and joys, was certainly led by somebody. And he said, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began to look, away, uh, look for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Suddenly the light had come on and they were exposed. And what was happening, suddenly Jesus was pointing it out, calling it out. This is not good enough. So the spiritual leaders of the temple had allowed the standards to slip. And instead of now bringing glory to God, they brought a day of robbery upon the house of God. So all that's happened. You seen the fig tree, seen the leaves, no fruit. Gone into the temple, seen the buying and selling of sacrifice, seen no fruit, no godly fruit. Just a whole lot of people making money out of something that was not theirs to make money out of. And then the next morning, it says, in the morning. So Jesus has gone another kip somewhere with his disciples probably rented a room somewhere they went along and they saw that the fig tree had withered from its roots that's an interesting I, I, I only just thought of this this is not in my notes trees don't normally wither from their roots do they they normally wither from the tips of the branches and then it dies and the roots the last thing to get out and I can tell you that for nothing because I've got two trees in my front garden that I, I saw down two years ago and to try and still dig the roots out is a whole lot of hassle. And, and uh, I'm trying to break them up as, quick, as much as I can, but they, I, still, I still not quite finally got the roots out. The roots are the last thing to go and give up on. But this is not what the scripture says here. You can think on that. Oh, that's one for free. That's a bit of Bible study. Peter remembered and said to him, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree of cursed has withered. See, words are incredibly powerful. Whether positive or negative, our words have a tremendous effect on people's lives. We have to be incredibly careful about what we say. I've started cutting some vocabulary out of my mouth. Not swear words, because I don't go around cussing people. But I, never, I stop myself saying now, I'm frightened to death. I'm not frightened to death. I know when I die, I'm going to be with Jesus, so why would I be frightened to death? That's not a faith-filled word, that's a fear-filled word. We, have to, we catch ourselves and say all sorts of things that are negative. And the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And so what Jesus has said in terms of this curse to this fig tree had truly come to pass. And so his disciples are now intrigued because they'd heard him, the scripture said earlier, didn't it? they heard him say these words and now they've gone back and the tree is now withered and died according to Jesus' word. So now he begins to, I love the way that Jesus then teaches on. Do you know what I mean? Gets an explanation out of what, what they're seeing and doing. That, this is proper discipleship. This is what I'm trying to talk about with some of the young guys that I'm taking some time out with. Is I want them to see things in my life and then explain what it is and why God is doing what he's doing. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing here. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes they will see it happen. And it will be done for them. See, we have to notice the link between what we say and what we believe. You read the book of James, you find a whole lot of stuff in there about that. But the, the thing is here is that faith is activated by our words. What does the scripture says about our salvation? Is, the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts, then we're saved. It's not just a matter of believing in our hearts. There's a confession with our mouths. I was only thinking about that the other day. Well, actually, Wednesday when I was praying with Andy uh, as he came to the prayer meeting. Lovely sense of God's presence here. Some real intercession going on. But from the day that he gave his life to the Lord and he gave his life to the Lord and he truly believed in his heart. But when he went into that baptismal tank, he gave confession here in front of you all that God had saved him and set him free. And from that moment on, his alcoholism was broken. He was still struggling with it until the day that he went into the baptismal tank. 
But he was, I believe he was truly born again in those moments. Because it's just not a matter of believing with our heart. There has to be a confession of faith from our mouth. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we can get people to say they believe. There's lots of people who told me that they believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the cross. But, well, you need to make some confession of it then. And, and that's the whole reason we still baptise people and we believe 100% fundamentally in, the, in, in the, the sacrament of baptism because it's a confession. We ask people to confess on the confession of your faith, we now baptise you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you will receive it and it will be yours. You see, faith is not believing you can have it. Faith is believing that you've got it already. Faith is not believing that you can have it. That's kind of hope, a bit of a hope so. Faith is believing I have it already. I'm praying in faith and faith believing, the scripture says. Not faith hoping, faith believing. I believe that I've, Mark, I think it's in, in, in Mark's gospel again when he says, I believe that I've received. So he, he already believes that it's in his hand before he's even taken it from the hand of his father. I believe that I've received. Have you received? No, I believe that I've received. This is not mental gymnastics. I'm not trying to kind of create a whole bit of a strange doctrine here. This is the, this is the teaching of the Bible, that we believe and we receive. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. There's, there's no doubt about that. If you believe that you shall be saved, you are saved, aren't you? Most Wednesdays I... I come to the prayer meeting and I'm always, it's my little time with God. Not that I don't have other times with God, but I just feel I hate getting out of bed early. So get on a Wednesday morning when I get up early and, and spend some time with God, then come here. It's kind of my sacrifice time in terms of intercession. I don't always feel like it and I don't always feel like I've benefited from it. Just being honest, let's be an honest church. We don't always feel like we've benefited from church. Sometimes I have a meal, I don't feel like I really enjoyed it that much, but my body has benefited from it. So, you know, I've said that to you before. Don't worry about reading the scriptures and thinking that, you haven't, that you've forgotten half of what you've just read. I can't remember what I had for dinner last Thursday, but it did me good, you know. And coming to the prayer meeting and coming to the Bible study and, and, and exercising our faith and reading our Bible and praying, is good because it builds us up spiritually. Whether we feel like it's building us up, man. The times I've been to the gym and dragged myself there and been absolutely exhausted when I got off the treadmill and didn't feel like it was doing me any good at all. But when I went to Slimming World on the, on the Friday and weighed in, whoa, had it done me some good? Of course it had. But it didn't feel like it was doing me any good. And so, so all I'm trying to say is that some mornings I come here and I feel like it's, you know, I'm asking a lot of things of God and I'm not really connecting with God. But when I'm speaking words of faith, it's, it's always connected in my heart whether I feel it or not. And uh, we've seen some incredible answers to prayer over many years. But I was listening to Mike Bickle, who runs the Kansas House of Prayer. 24-hour prayer movement now. He's, for the last 18 years, they've prayed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They haven't just got one prayer meeting going on. They've got multiple prayer rooms across the campus. In fact, they've got a room where they just pray for North Korea. There's about 40 people night and day praying for North Korea. So when revival hits there, you can say, the people of God prayed it in. Won't just have happened by chance. But Mike Bickle said, he's been the senior leader of all this all the time. And of course, the leaders like to take their slots. And uh, some slots are better than others, you know. You know it'd be great to have like, the Sunday morning slot or, the, or the, uh, a nice evening slot about six o'clock. And then you can go home and have your tea. And, but he got the graveyard slot, which was seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning when everybody wants to lie in or everybody takes their kids to football or horse riding or swimming. And he said... That was the poorest attended slot of the week, funnily enough, Saturday mornings, because people had had a week at work and they'd even get up and pray late at Friday night because they were lying on a Saturday morning. And he said the one Saturday morning he went in and uh, he was, he, there, was, there was a couple of people milling around just in prayer on their knees, but there, there was no music team up there and he was expecting the music team. But as he, as he got into the, into the building, he'd heard a lot of singing and... Um, and he couldn't put two and two together because there wasn't that many people around and, and he sounded like there's a whole choir in there and he asked the Lord, he said, no, that's the angels, they're, they're singing, they're, the angels are singing. And he said, uh, uh, he said, it was the strangest thing in all the world, he said, uh, he said, I expected revival to fall in that meeting. So when everybody got there, the half a dozen that had come to pray that Saturday morning with a few that was already there, he goes, listen, the angels have been singing, the angels have been singing. 
And one old guy on the front row said, you are stupid. The angels are singing every time that we come. It's just you're not listening. And I think there's, there's an element in which we have got to keep on pushing through, whether we see it or we feel it or we don't. House of prayer for all nations. That we get through and we pray and we believe God. And finally he says this, and it's, it's a challenge to all of us. When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. I've been working with James because he wants to give his testimony around this gang thing. And we want to start to challenge some of the young people about the culture of the gang as opposed to the culture of Christianity, really. Although in the schools, we're going to have to be very careful what we say. But one of the key things that we're going to talk about is forgiveness. Can I just say this? Forgiveness is not for the person that you forgive. Forgiveness is for you. Because sometimes... People have rubbed you up the wrong way and you feel like kicking and screaming and punching them and saying all sorts of things against them and they have no idea they've upset you. I've, I've sometimes, I've, I've been raging on the inside against somebody that's done something. Do you know what? They didn't really realise they'd done anything to, at all. And when I'm going to talk to them about it, they're like, really, me? No. No. And if I did, I'm really sorry. Forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is for us. Because when you hold unforgiveness in your heart, it's a barrier. That's what he says here. If you have anything against anybody, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. It's a barrier for connecting with God. Unforgiveness is one of those things, you know. And I don't care how old we are in the faith or how young we are in the faith. We have to learn the lessons of the principles of the kingdom. And when we're walking around with unforgiveness in our hearts, God cannot pour his grace upon us in the way that he wants to. And for me, that's a huge, huge challenge. Again, it's all about, have I got the leaves on the outside but no fruit on the inside? You know, so I'm, I'm in church, I'm raising my hands, shabba dabba do, all the rest of the stuff. But, you know, if I'm harboring unforgiveness in my heart or I've got something against one of my brothers or I'm just in this real corner, like, uh, well, I don't, I don't see why I should be doing that. They're, they're never nice to me. I'm not going to be nice to them. Listen, we need to learn the principles of the kingdom. And so I just hope those few thoughts of help tonight in, in some kind of way the, the, the focus is on not on everybody else but the focus is on my tree I don't want Jesus to come along to my fig tree and go well there's lots of leaves but there's no fruit or come along to this house of prayer and go well it's all right but there's a whole lot of noise but there's a whole lot of stuff going on that's not pleasing my heart we've got to be careful we've got to be careful that we, we, we serve God wholeheartedly and give him the best that we can give him can we pray and then we'll just uh, have a short song to finish Kelf. Just, just have a moment. We normally do this with the bread and the wine, but you, 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 don't need, you don't need to do that tonight. You can just examine your own heart in the light of the word of God. So therefore let a man examine himself that he might eat of the drink of this cup. And... Because the scripture is very clear that sometimes we eat and drink condemnation on ourselves because we're eating in an unworthy manner. Now, none of us are worthy to come to the table of the Lord. That's not what he's talking. He's not talking about righteousness that Jesus has clothed us in. He's talking about the attitudes that we still harbour and the things that we say and the things that we shouldn't do. And we just hold it all on the inside and we pretend that we're, we're all good with everybody else because the communion is not just about being good with God. It's about being good with everybody else. So, Father, tonight I just pray that you would help us as we just look on the inside, that we might say the right things, that we might not be hypocrites, but a Father, that we might tru truly, truly serve you with all that we have in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.